When I was a junior in college, I took a modern American literature course under a professor who I would call Dr. H. Her class took place right after the lunch period, so many of her students would come into the classroom looking like they were ready for a nap. Dr. H sympathized with us, so before she started the day's lecture, she would tell us an interesting story in hopes of waking us up a bit. Usually her stories were tidbits about the author we were studying that day. Some stories were more successful than others in getting our attention, but there was one story she told that got everyone's attention. She said that the story was a little long, but she thought that we would find it interesting because, as she put it, the devil is in the details. Dr. H was a senior in college at the time this story took place. She shared a room with another senior who I would call S., they had both spent the day reading and working on papers for the week ahead, only breaking once to eat some sandwiches while listening to the radio. At about 8pm, Dr. H and S decided to reward themselves with the rest of the night off. Dr. H had a novel that she had been dying to read while S wanted to treat herself to some cocktails. S told Dr. H that she would only be gone for an hour tops. She then said in a joking manner, if I'm not back in two hours, make sure the police find my body at least. S decided to have a cocktail or two at the bar that was popular with her classmates because it was so close to campus. She sat down at the bar and ordered a dry martini. She didn't notice that she was seated right next to a man until she looked up from her glass and was greeted with a smile. The man tipped his tumbler at her and said, Hello. S was immediately embarrassed, especially because there was an empty seat to her right. She was about to move to the other seat, feeling as if though she had violated one of the unspoken rule of bars. But before she could get out of her seat, the man said, Hey, you don't have to move, if you don't want to. I like the company. The man extended his hand to S and introduced himself as Chris. He said that he worked in construction and was renting a room in the area. He asked S what she was studying and she told him she was a psychology major. Chris's eyes lit up and to S's surprise, he began to talk about Freud and Jung. She told him she had to do an experiment for her final project and he asked her which method she would be using, an observational study or a survey. She told him that she wanted to make a link between lack of empathy and the potential for criminal behavior. She told him that she wanted to do an observational study, something similar to Milgram's controversial studies, but based on posing scenarios rather than shock experiments. Chris shook his head. You should do a survey instead. S pointed out that people could lie on a survey without thinking twice about it, but that it was a lot harder to lie to someone's face. Chris chuckled. Sweetheart, a psychology professor could look at a student the same student for three years and never have an inkling that the kid killed his mother and had her buried in his backyard. People can lie to your face if they want to keep a secret bad enough, but a true sicko can't refuse the chance to show his true colors on a survey because that guy, that guy wants to shock you. S listened as Chris argued that Jack the Ripper's letters proved his point, but she had already decided that though Chris knew some things about psychology, his lack of knowledge was beginning to show. Nevertheless, S still appreciated how passionate Chris was helping her make the right decision regarding her project. She eventually told Chris that she would bring up all of the good points he had made to her professor and this seemed to satisfy him. Though S was attracted to men her own age, Chris had a certain appeal. He was not bad looking for an older man, and most importantly, he was easy to talk to. Over the course of 45 minutes, they had talked about various subjects including psychology, politics, and places Chris had traveled while working various construction jobs. In all that time, Chris had not hit on S once. If Chris was trying to seduce her, he was being admirably patient in his approach, he did offer to buy S another martini when she finished her first and though S would have normally said no to the offer, she felt so comfortable around Chris that she let him buy her a drink. While she had carefully nursed her first martini, S quickly drained her second, 
and without asking permission first, Chris bought her another. S didn't mind because she wanted to spend some more time with Chris. It pleased her that Chris seemed to have no expectations for anything in return for his generosity. S's attention quickly turned momentarily from Chris to the television behind the bartender. The newscaster was giving a preview for the evening's news which included a story about a fatal car accident that had occurred earlier that morning. S told Chris that she had heard about the accident on the radio that afternoon. She said that she felt terrible because a whole family had lost their lives in the head-on crash. Chris replied, I wonder if anyone was beheaded. <laughs> then chuckled. She was stunned by his sudden change. It was like an invisible mask had quietly slipped off of Chris's face to reveal the true man underneath. S had an urge to leave the bar, but the psychology major in her was intrigued. She had read about inappropriate affect and emotional personality disorders, but she had never met someone who displayed any of those characteristics before. Any desire that she had to sleep with Chris was now over, but she thought that he might be an interesting story to share with her fellow psychology majors. S continued to listen as Chris started talking in graphic detail about some of the accidents that he had seen at construction sites, including one guy whose hand and wrist had gotten pulled into a cement mixer, and another guy who fell four stories from scaffolding and wound up a twisted mess on the rubble below. The whole time he was talking about his fellow co-workers being maimed or killed on the job, Chris was smiling and giggling. S tried not to show her disgust, but when Chris followed up a story of one of his co-workers being impaled by a rebar by inviting S to his room for some real drinks, S suddenly remembered that she had told her roommate she would be back in an hour. Chris's face was suddenly indifferent. Not angry or sad, but more cold and expecting. Most men would have tried to turn on the charm in hopes of salvaging the night with a potential conquest, but Chris had already caught the eye of a blonde that had just walked into the bar. S said goodnight. Chris gave her a little wave, but said nothing. When S finally arrived back to her room, S apologized for being late. She told Dr. H that she had been talking with a man. Dr. H smiled at the news and said, so what was he like? S replied, He was interesting, but not in a good way. Early that morning, Dr. H was woken by a pounding sound on the door. She heard the RA shouting on the other side of the door, Hey, wake up! The campus is on lockdown! Dr. H had to shake S awake. They went outside to the hallway and saw the other occupants on the floor standing in nightgowns and pajamas, crying, whispering, or just looking dazed and confused. The RAs looked panic as they spoke to each other in whispers. Dr. H learned through various conversations that multiple girls had been brutally attacked on campus just moments ago. Police believed that the killer could still be on the campus. No one in the dorm and at the moment knew the extent of what had just taken place. Later that morning, each girl in the dorm was asked if they had seen anyone strange that night. For a moment, S thought of Chris, but she told herself more than likely that Chris was with a woman right now. S told the officer no and thought nothing more about it. When a news report finally broke a month later showing that the campus killer had been apprehended, there was a collective sigh of relief and a few loud cheers from the young woman gathered around the television. Dr. H smiled, but when she turned to look at S, her roommate was staring at the television. Her eyes were wide and her face looked pallid. S said, I think I'm going to throw up. It was not until two years later when Dr. H, who had just finished her master's degree, and S, who was now a law student, were having brunch that the subject of that horrifying night was brought up again. Dr. H said that, S suddenly looked like she was not feeling too good. Dr. H asked S what was wrong. There was a pause as S took a sip of her orange juice. Dr. H could see that S's hand was shaking, and S finally spoke. That night at the bar, if Chris had asked me to go to his room 30 minutes into our conversation, I would have 
gladly have gone. S began to tear up. She then added, I wonder... I wonder if I would even be here right now. The man S had drinks with that night was Ted Bundy. I grew up in a small town in Norway. There was mostly horrible people there, including some of the teachers that worked at my school. I had just started in fifth grade. I was already sick of school, but trying to be positive, we got introduced to our new teachers. Let's call my gym teacher Jake. I was a chubby girl, so I hated gym. Not because I got tired, but because I had to change and shower with the other girls, so I went to Jake and said I will change when the other girls had left, which he said was fine. The gym class was over and I waited for the other girls to leave. After they left, I took my clothes off and went into the shower. When I was going to get dressed, I saw Jake standing right behind me. I jumped and he looked at me and smiled. I grabbed my towel real fast and wrapped it around my body. He kept staring at me and the further down his eyes went, the more he smiled. I felt really uncomfortable and asked what he wanted. His smile disappeared and he looked at me and said he didn't want anything. He was about to leave when he said, Hurry up! and squeezed my shoulder and left. Then there was the next gym class. This time he came in and looked at me in the shower. I didn't notice until I was done. He stared me down and I asked, Can you just please move? He shook his head, and that's when I started to feel very scared. He stared at my chest, and I kept telling him to move. After a while, I tried to push him, and then he grabbed my arm and said, Hey, bad girls get punished. He slapped me and grabbed me. I screamed and told him to stop. He left, and I was so scared that I threw up. I looked in the mirror to see that my cheek was really red and you could see his hand printed on my face. At that time I wasn't really sure about what just happened so I was in shock. My friend Jamie came and looked at my face. She grabbed my shoulder and asked hysterically, what, what happened? I tried to hold my tears back. She kept asking over and over to which I responded, I don't, I don't want to talk about it, okay? I didn't live too far away from school, so I went home, still scared and shaking. My mom is really sick, so she can't work and that means she was home. I ran into my room before my mom saw me and started bawling. After a while, my mom came in and asked in an angry tone, Why are you home now? I didn't answer, so she walked in and saw my face. Oh my god, what happened? I got up and hugged my mom as I kept crying. After I calmed down, she sat down with me and asked again what had happened. I told her everything. She was livid. She wanted to go to the police, but I just wanted him away from the school. I was already scared and said I wouldn't tell the police, so we went to school to tell the principal. I didn't see him at school anymore and that made me happy, until about two months later I got a text saying, Hi sexy. I thought maybe one of my classmates was pranking me, so I ignored it. I kept doing my homework, and then I got more messages. How are you, sexy? I was uncomfortable and replied, who is this? After five minutes, I got a new text saying his name. It felt like I was going to throw up. Back then, I couldn't block numbers, or at least I didn't know how to. A few weeks had passed, and I was still getting messages from Jake but now I completely ignored his messages and the more I ignored him, the more angry his texts got. Stop ignoring me. I know where you live. I can show up at your house at any moment. Answer me. And so on. I called his nonsense and ignored it. Three weeks had passed and Jake stopped texting me. I was going home from a birthday party and I heard noises coming from behind me, but it was no one there, so I kept walking and finally got home. And then I got a text. Jake sent a picture of me through my window saying, You look cute in that dress. 
I freaked out. I didn't want to move and I didn't want to turn around to look out my window. But I had to move. So I turned around to see that he was standing so close to my window that I could see his breath. He gave me the most disgusting smile and laughter. I screamed so loud so my dad and my mom came running into my room really fast to see that Jake was gone. I told mom and dad everything and showed them the text and they went straight to the police. He was arrested but only got six months in jail. I still can't get his laughter and that disgusting smile out of my head. To this day he still texts me and I have to go to therapy once a week. When I was a teenager, I was pretty hot. 5'2", blonde hair, brown eyes, stacked, and a magnet for creeps and such. When this happened, I was 16. At the time, public bus was my main form of transportation. I was coming home from my best friend's house, by myself at night. Not super late, but back then, in the mid-90s, the buses started running hourly after 7. I had just missed my normal bus that runs the busy, well-lit street south of my apartments and decided to take the bus that runs the less busy, darker road north of my apartments rather than wait at the transit center for an hour in the dark by myself. As soon as I enter the bus, the creepiest freak on board starts staring holes through my face. He is probably at least 30, ugly, pale, horrible red poofy hair, wearing the typical 90s stoner apparel of the green flannel, jeans, t-shirt of some dumb band, and some converse. This loser stares me down the entire ride. He is seated two rows ahead of me, but turned in his seat with this ridiculous smile on his face staring at me the entire way. It's only a 15 to 20 minute ride, but when some freak is staring at you like that for that amount of time, it seems like hours. My stop comes and I ring the bell. He shoots up out of his seat and goes to the rear exit door. So then I am internally freaking out. I have mace on me, but what if that is not enough? I am small and although I was pretty athletic, I had never fought a grown man. He gets off and turns and stops and waits for me, with that stupid smile on his face. As I go to exit the bus, another man stands up to exit. Now I am really freaking out. I am already stepping out of the bus now with two men, one in front of one behind. I had my mace in hand and I was going to just start spraying, even if I got myself, because at least they wouldn't be able to attack me and maybe I could crawl to safety. I knew the area kind of well and there was a house a half a block up I could try and get to. As I leave the bus and take one step away, the freak in front actually takes a step toward me, but then the man behind steps off and the freak's expression finally changes from that creepy smile to an annoyed look. He turns and starts quickly walking down the hill, almost running. I quickly turn to the man behind me. He says, I saw him watching you and uh, I was not letting you get off with that freak alone. I started crying with relief because I am 95% sure that freak was going to hurt me. He walked me to the entrance of my apartments just in case he was waiting for me somewhere and honestly, he's my hero. So just in case, if you are the man in Milwaukee, Oregon on the 32nd bus that saved a teenage girl from who knows what horrors that night, thank you so much. I don't remember your name or face, but I will never and will never forget what you did for me. It was over 10 years ago. I can't really remember how old I was. MySpace was still popping, so that old. I was sitting in the computer room scrolling through some old social media site that is no longer in use when my brother comes into the room demanding the computer. I told him to get lost. I had the computer first and he could wait his turn. He kept bugging me. He would throw things at me, tickle me, punch me. You know, annoying little brother things. He told me, if you don't move, I'm going to choke you out. 
I laughed and told him to go for it. He came up behind me and placed me in a chokehold, and we were both laughing as I tried to get out of his grasp. I remember slowly blinking and when I opened my eyes, the room was black. I remember being extremely confused and I remember not being able to feel my body. I don't know how else to put it, but something made me physically turn around and I remember seeing reds, oranges. The floor moved like lava and in front of me was a dark silhouetted extremely muscular figure that I could only see from neck down and torso up. At the same time that my eyes met the silhouette, he was already swinging to hit me, and when his fist connected to my face, it was like I was snapped back into reality. I was breathing heavy and sweating profusely. I looked over to my brother who was just sitting there, staring at me bewildered. He asked me if I was okay, and told me that my eyes rolled back in the back of my head, and it looked like I was having a seizure. I have no freaking idea what happened, but any form of answers y'all might have, I'm open to hearing. So when I was about four years old, I lived in a trailer court. It was kind of creepy and lots of old people lived there. I lived there for one year with my mom, brother, and sister until one day I found this weird Rapunzel doll, and it looked so old and musty and dirty you could tell that it was very old, but me being four and clueless, I took the doll home. I played with it for a while and I was getting bored with it, so I gave it to my friend Bella. She was only two years older than me, so she took it without any questions at all. That night when I went to bed, I was just about to fall asleep, like my eyes were closed and then I feel a pressure just along my back, and the hair on the back of my neck stood up and I felt like a soft scratch on my back. At first, I thought it was some kind of cat, which we did have one. Her name was Snowflake. But she didn't have claws, so it couldn't have been her. So after piecing that together, I froze and closed my eyes and cried and soon fell asleep. That morning, I told my mom what had happened she said I was dreaming. That night it happened again, and that whole next week it would happen every night until one night I was lying down and my blanket was pulled off of me, and violent slicing claws would be scratching all over my body. Let's just say, that morning I moved in with my grandma. I have seen things, things that I will probably not forget. I work as a security tape reviewer for a security company. My job most of the time is viewing live feed from camera circuits at night, watching various monitors. Most of today's camera equipment, as in the DVRs, come with functions of movement detection. This means they alert us at the central and one monitor automatically tunes in when there is movement. However, there are still places that keep the DVR offline. This means that the DVR is not connected to the central, and it keeps recording in an internal hard drive. In these cases, if something happens, such as theft or things of that sort, someone has to review the recordings. Most of the time, that is done by the local police, but in some cases, if the police have too much to do, the company is authorized to review the tapes. Then the reviewer has to write a report with timestamps and give the raw footage to the police. Some days ago I received a call in the middle of the night at around 2am. I was at work so I picked up the phone quickly. It was my boss. He then told me that a coworker would come to my shift, that he would need me to go home for the day because I would have to travel to another city on the afternoon of the next day. He then explained to me that there was a sealed DVR in a farmhouse and that the police wanted it reviewed. However, it was sealed in steel and fixed into the concrete, and I would have to go there with a steel cutter to pry it out from the wall. For me, it was good news, as I get to stay a week at home with the DVR for reviewing. I went home and got some sleep. I woke up the next day and I already had the address marked on my phone. 
I traveled the whole afternoon and arrived there at dusk. I arrived to a rural property in the outskirts of the town where a police car was waiting for me at the entrance. I parked my car behind the police and got out. As soon as I got out, I noticed something was wrong. A strong smell of rotten flesh made me gag as the police officer got out of the car to meet me. Hello? Are you John? Yes. I then showed my documents to him confirming my ID. Alright, come with me, John. The power's been out for some days now. I got my equipment and started following him. We got inside a wooden fence gate and the smell got worse. A farmhouse could be seen at the distance. As night was finally falling, we turned on our flashlights. As we got closer, I could see various wooden fences at the side of the house. I then asked, So, what happened here? The police officer stopped for a second and looked at me. Well, Mr. John, it seems that this dude got left inside this property alone for about six weeks, hung himself, and then ended the life of all the farm animals with him. My heart sank. I've seen people getting shot before, but the idea of seeing someone dangling there for the first time was bad to me. But if you already know what happened, why am I going to be reviewing the tapes? It's because the family said the dude was healthy. They forced an investigation to be open. What a waste of resources, in my opinion, to be honest. We went quietly to the doorstep. The house was of average size. The walls, yellow with dirt stains. In a small fence covered by the roof, there was a sink and a washing machine. Near it, the main door. We walked in the area. At the door, the cop hesitated at the door handle. We cleaned the thing already, but the smell is stuck in the building. As we got in, I noticed the door was abnormally thick. After the front door, there was a living room with an old sofa and old TV there. On the right, a long corridor with three doors at the side and a shelf on it. As we were passing through the first door, I noticed that this one was made of steel. The door also had two big padlocks made from steel. I asked, Why is this door made of... The cop interrupted me. There's a stairway leading to a basement on that door. There was nothing there aside from an empty room down there. Why the thick padlocks? Well, how am I supposed to know that? The owner of the house asked for us to do that as soon as we got the body out of the house. Oh, so this guy wasn't the owner? No, he was hired to take care of the house. The next two doors were a kitchen and a bedroom. Inside the bedroom at the corner I saw a metal box concreted to the wall. Well, this is it. I got my equipment and started working as the cop helped me illuminate the area. In half an hour or less, I had removed the metal box from the concrete. It was really heavy and inside I could feel a DVR, still working on its spare battery. As I was inspecting the box, the cop was with me. Suddenly we hear a metal bang. The cop jumps gets his gun and points it to the door with his flashlight. Who's there? Nothing answers. He starts walking slowly through the house as I went after him, thinking it might be someone or some animal. He inspects the whole house aside from the locked room. We conclude that it might have been some animal. The cop helped me carry the heavy box all the way to the car. Before going, he used a roll of police tape around the box, only letting the on-off switch, the VGA, and a USB port uncovered. The energy cable was outside already. I thanked him for the help, and I went home. I arrived late at night, so I immediately went to sleep. The next day, I woke up and started working on the DVR. I left it in my room as I still lived with my mom at the time. First, I confirmed that all the excess weight was probably due to a large battery inside. I plugged a monitor and a mouse to it, as I could see it was still on. The DVR was a very good one with up to 12 cameras. All the cameras were unplugged when I took it from the wall, but in the darkness and the smell at the farmhouse, 
I forgot to count how many there were. The second thing I noticed is that the DVR was accusing problems with connection. That was weird, since the thing shouldn't have any internet connection at all. As I started examining the connection status, I found that it was indeed trying to connect to a Wi-Fi connection that now had limited access. I assumed that somewhere inside the metal box there was a Wi-Fi routing a 3G chip. That was the only way someone could get internet in that area. I closed all the connections for the time being. I then time searched for around seven weeks ago, and the cameras were completely still. There was no movement. I realized that there were ten cameras at that place. That's an absurdly big number for a farmhouse. I set all of them for motion only and set it for a faster speed. All of them went dark. The footage slows down as I see the camera, 11 flickering on and off. There was too much static on it so I couldn't see. Some seconds later it starts going fast again. Camera 11 didn't flicker anymore. In fact, it didn't even seem on. In the space of what would be like almost two days, the image did not have any motion detection, so all I could see was black. However, the camera feed went on suddenly. Cameras 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 were clearly outside cameras as they were activated by rain falling on their lenses by the morning. All of them were around the house, each one viewing a side of the house. Camera 1 was viewing the main wooden gate. Camera 2 was mounted in a motorized base, going right and left. This camera was able to see a landfill at the side of the house, and in the distance, some animal pens could be seen. I deactivated the motion capture and had a good look at all the cameras. Camera 6 was in the concreted area outside. Camera 7 was in the living room, recording the sofa in the main door. Camera 8 was viewing the corridor inside the house. Camera 9 was at the kitchen. Camera 10 was viewing the bedroom. Inside the bedroom, there was another wooden door, and as the door was opened, I could see a bathroom inside. I accelerated the footage until I saw an old truck parking outside of the wooden gate. From there, two people got out. An older guy and a younger guy. They walked inside the fence and started walking inside the house. I could see that the older guy was showing the house to the younger one. I could hear a faint sound coming from my sound system. I turned the volume up. Voices. The whole system was filled with high-grade microphones in every camera, which is very unusual for a farmhouse system. I watched as they went outside and the older dude started giving instructions to the younger man, and the older man finally went away, leaving the young dude there. I started getting bored, so I accelerated the footage. Whole days went by in minutes for me as I observed the man's routine through the days. I then realized something. Camera 8 at the corridor would go offline sometimes. I then stopped the system and went to check. I won't get into particulars, but it would seem as though every day the camera would go offline for 3 or 4 hours on the afternoon by itself. Thing is, someone had deliberately got into the system and erased those particular parts. I then searched for all of the footage on camera 8 for that specific time and then started reviewing it. The camera would go offline around 1 p.m. and would go back online around 3 or 4 p.m. That's until I saw it. Whoever was erasing it either wasn't very smart or didn't have the time to do it, as he had managed to erase the DVR log, but he forgot to erase all of the days. So on a Wednesday for the guy, I could see what happened. After lunch, the man went outside to the animal pens. He got a chicken and went into a small barn behind the house. From there, he got out with a bucket filled with chicken parts. He went into the house and got in front of the locked door at the corridor. He used a key to open one of the padlocks at the door and a smaller door opened, almost like a prison door. The man then threw parts of the chicken inside, closed the small door and locked it. I was at a loss for words. Maybe the dude kept an animal inside the room, like a big dog. I had seen my share of weird people, so I thought nothing more of it. My thoughts were to, why would anyone delete the footage? 
I went back to the previous viewing, with the ten cameras on again. I then felt a bit hungry and went downstairs to get something to eat. I accidentally left the footage going. I ended up forgetting about it and even went out with my friends. I came back late at night and when I went into my bedroom, I could see the footage still going, now at night. I sat in the chair looking at the video. The image at night was very clear, almost as if though all the lights were on. That's when I realized the house had infrared spotlights all over the property, which is extremely rare for a rural property. Camera 11 started to come in and out of existence again. I got closer to the screen as it finally stayed on. All I could see was a grey room, completely empty, with only stone stairs at the side. The place had no visible windows but also had an infrared spotlight. And then it went offline again. I was weirded out by the whole situation already. A loud metallic bang went by the sound system. I stared at the corridor camera as it got the noise again. The dude was a heavy sleeper, didn't even move with the noise. I then stopped the footage and called it a day. The next day I woke up early, got a cup of coffee and started viewing the footage again. The speed was good and the days were going normal. Then I saw the man staring at the metal door during a morning and that's when I quickly got to normal speed again. He was now examining one of the padlocks, the one he probably didn't have the key to. I say that because sometime later the man came back with a bunch of tools. He tampered with the padlock until it finally gave to a wrench. The dude then got a heavy wrench and went through the door. I raised the corridor camera volume. Nothing. The man comes back two minutes later. I then see the motion detection of the living room camera going on and off once really fast, but there was nothing on the video feed. The man closes the door and manages to put the padlock on once again. He then mumbles, Crazy old man. He then goes on the usual routine for the day. I accelerated the footage slightly now. The corridor camera goes offline as usual. Night falls and the man goes to sleep. As he is sleeping, I see the motion sensors going on and off on the cameras around the house. I stop and rewind the video, observing it again. On the video, and even with the lights of the infrared spotlights, I could see nothing. I even took a note. The motion sensors are malfunctioning. I then heard a loud bang at the side of the house. Camera 9. The one at the kitchen got most of the noise. The man wakes up, turns on all the lights and goes out with a gun. He then starts screaming while going around the house. I'll get you! Where are you? He keeps going around the house, goes to the animal pens and then comes back. He locks all the doors and keeps the gun at his side as he sleeps. The next day, went as usual and so did the next. When I looked at the time, it was night already. I left the footage on as I went to prepare my bed. I then sat down at the chair again to turn the whole thing off. There, it was night two and the dude was asleep. When I looked one more time at all the cameras, my heart began pounding. At the living room next to the main door, there was this tall, black figure, almost like a black sheet lifted around two meters into the air. I stopped the footage and rewinded to check if the dude had put it there. No. It appeared at around 3 a.m. out of nowhere, and I had this horrible feeling. I knew whatever it was, it just felt wrong. Then the thing raised an elongated black arm and pointed in the direction of the camera. I immediately closed off everything and went to bed. At night, I felt like something was wrong. I even closed the blinds of my window, even though I live on the second floor, I was scared and at the time I didn't know if it was a figure of my imagination, but I started to see black shadows passing in front of the window. It was almost morning when I finally went to sleep. I woke up for lunch and forced myself to get back to work. I started the footage from that next morning. I didn't want to see whatever that thing was again. The dude woke up and went to work as usual. Even during the day now, the motion sensors would go on and off even though there was nobody there. 
The dude came back for the night. I accelerated the footage until that thing appeared once again. This time, it was in his room, and it stayed there, like if it was staring at him. The man then woke up and went to the bathroom, apparently not noticing the thing right next to his bed. He laid down again and went back to sleep. The things started turning to the camera again, and I quickly turned the feed off and started it again on the next recording day. The day began as usual, but this time, something happened. The dude went into the kitchen and stood there for some seconds, said something, and went back to his room. He then came back to the kitchen. I rewinded the tape and raised the volume, the man said. What did, what did I come to do here? I found it weird, but everyone has those weird lapses from time to time. The dude repeated that three or four times during the day in different tasks, and then he went to bed, and this time there was no dark figure. The motion sensors were going absolutely crazy. Aside from that, the night went by with no incidents. At morning, the man took his time to get out of bed. Two hours, in fact. He went into the kitchen, and first thing he says is, what did I come here to do? He keeps an empty stare the whole time, goes back to his room and tries again. This time he does breakfast and goes to work. He became weird as the day progressed, forgetting things and talking to himself. The day finally ended and he went to bed. At night at around 3am he wakes up. He starts walking around the house slowly, almost as if he is twitching at every movement. He then opens the front door stops at it, and keeps looking outside with an empty stare. He does that for the next two hours without moving. He then leaves the door opened and goes to his room. He lays on the bed and stays there for some good hours. I was very disturbed at this point, but nothing could prepare me for what was coming. When the dude woke up by morning, he just went outside he then proceeded to release all the animals in the farm. Some pigs even got inside the house as the door was opened. He then comes inside again, closing the door with the pigs inside. The man just starts talking to the pigs, as if though they were humans, his voice going grave sometimes as if the man was drunk. He stays sitting on the floor in his bedroom, talking to the pigs until night. One of the pigs defecates on the floor. The man removes his pants and does the same. He stays there, sitting on the floor. The man stands up and starts walking slowly to the front door. He goes outside. Camera 2 can see a big pig sitting on the landfill. The man comes behind the pig and grabs it. The pig starts squealing. The man then does unspeakable things to the pig, and the pig ends up defecating and biting him. After that, the pig runs away screaming. The man then returns to his room and lays on his bed. At morning, stains of feces and blood can be seen on his sheets. He woke up at around 1pm and stood up. First thing he does is kneeling next to a pile of his own feces. He then proceeds to eat it, littered with flies. After that, he stands up and goes around the property. He comes back from the animal pens with four small piglets. He closes the main door and releases the animals. The man proceeds to try to dress them in his own clothes. Gets visibly distressed when they don't wear it. One of them ends up defecating. The man stops everything and eats the feces from the pig. He then screams in anger. A bigger pig that was laying around gets all of his rage. The smaller piglets squeal as the larger one gets kicked into its eventual demise. Then he proceeds to opening the poor animal, pulling out its innards and playing with it. He then steps on three of the piglets and ends the life of the last one by biting its head. I finally vomited watching. I stopped the video and went outside a bit. It was around 5pm already. Decided to call it a day and started to prepare my stuff for sleeping. I woke up in the middle of the night and with my eyes closed I could hear whispers. When I opened my eyes a dark mass was on top of my bed on the ceiling, moving and whispering. I screamed and turned on the lights and the thing disappeared immediately. 
My mom came running from downstairs, getting in my bedroom. John, what is it? Uh, nothing, nothing, just, just a bad dream. My mom agreed and gave me a cup of water. I then went to sleep, but with the lights on. I slept very few hours that day. At morning, I had to go to my friend's house and I stayed there until evening. At dusk, I arrived home. When I got inside my house, I felt something was wrong. I heard my mom calling from her room. John? The lights wouldn't turn on. I started walking, but I froze as soon as I saw the main corridor of my house. It was dark, abnormally dark, as if liquid darkness was blocking my way. John! Heard my mom again. I would have to go through the dark corridor to her room. John, come here. My mom sounded more irritated now, but I stood there looking at the darkness. John, come here. I'm ordering you to come here. I couldn't move. I still felt something was wrong. John, come here now. My mom's voice was basically screaming now. I walked out from the house, never taking my eyes from the darkness. My mom's voice would now scream very aggressively. I finally stepped out from my house and closed the door, my heart pounding. I stood there on the front porch looking at the door for some time until I heard steps behind me. John? My mom's voice came from behind me. She then exclaimed that she had to go to the market to get some stuff, and I was visibly shaken. When my mom got into the house, the lights went on as normal. She then made me some tea and I went to sleep, all lights on once again. I woke up the next day by morning. It took a while to get courage to look at the video again that morning, but I finally did. It picked up on where I left. The man naked in his living room with four dead piglets. It was afternoon already and the man went outside with the piglets. He proceeded to dig spots on the landfill, used some thick logs as stakes on the ground, and then nailed the corpses of the pigs to the logs. He then came inside. He stops at the main door and turns around, going out again. Goes in the barn at the back of the house and gets something. Proceeds to go to the animals' pens. Chickens, horses, and pigs can be heard in panic as the man screams and laughs. I was breathing heavily by now. Finally, the noises stopped. All became silent for a while. Suddenly, movement. The man comes crawling on all fours with an ungodly speed. I hold my breath as he goes into the house, still crawling around. The microphone picked up as the man growled around the house like an animal. At this point, I was freaking out. The man stops, lays next to the corridor, and starts screaming. He screams and screams to the point his vocal cords snap, and he starts gurgling with his own blood. At some point, he stays there still. Dave finally came, and the man sits up. He starts crying, sitting on the ground. He then stands up and runs to the barn, comes out there with a rope, he uses the ceiling fan from his room as support and makes a makeshift lace. He then puts a chair on the bed and jumps. A loud snap is heard. I stopped the recording. I unplugged everything and carried the DVR to my car. I ended up taking the DVR to the security company that very same day. Things finally calmed down as I took the DVR away from my house. The police reached the conclusion again that the guy ended his own life, but I think there is something more to it. Whatever horror lurked inside that house, hopefully I will never know what it was. My brother would sleep in my room often. He's five years younger, so I didn't mind. He seemed scared to sleep alone for some reason. My parents chalked it up to nightmares and too many scary movies. Well, one night he wanted to sleep in my room again. My parents saw this and told him he couldn't and that if I let him, I'd be in trouble too. Not wanting to catch anything from them, I told him I couldn't and that I was sorry. He begged and pleaded with me, but I firmly declined. 
Eventually he sighed and gave up, going back to his room. I had shut and locked the door that night to ensure he didn't try to get in again. Sometime in the night, I had heard the doorknob rattling. I didn't say anything, but then listened as I heard the lock click, signaling the door had been unlocked. Now mind you, my brother and I aren't that bad at picking basic room locks, and so I wasn't surprised when this happened. The door opened and I turned to look, and I saw someone in a crawling position looking into my room. I sighed, thinking it was my brother, and said, Fine, get in here, but don't blame me when mom kills us both. What I thought was my brother crawled into the room, and I expected to feel his weight as he climbed on the bed, but it never came. A minute passed and I looked over. The door was still wide open, and all I could see was the darkness in the hallway. I called out my brother's name and heard nothing. So I went down the hall into his room and, lo and behold, there he was, fast asleep. Needless to say, I slept in his room that night. This happened on spring break of 2015. I had just turned 18 years old a few weeks before this happened. I hate talking about this, it still makes me feel weak and sick, but this changed me into who I am today. I always love male attention. I've always been told I have a stunning body. I loved all the compliments and gifts from men trying to go out with me. So for my 18th birthday, I figured that I would start posting promiscuous pictures of me online. I went to a fairly popular site and posted pictures for a few days when some of the people made a Discord server just for me to share pictures and chat. I live in a fairly small community and figured the chances were pretty low someone would know me personally, but I still never posted my face or name. It went well for a few weeks. There were some creeps, but nothing too crazy. Until one day I posted a picture of myself in my mirror. I made sure to keep my face out of it like normal, but I didn't pay attention that my computer was in the background with a screensaver of me and my boyfriend at the time. Not long after posting the picture, people started to point it out. So in a panic, I deleted it, but it was too late. I started receiving messages from one of the members who claimed to know me and my stepfather. He was trying to blackmail me to pay him for favors or he would tell my parents. Not believing him, I ignored it at first and just went to bed. When I awoke the next morning and checked in on the server, I had another private message from the man with a picture of the front of my house. Stunned, I didn't know what to do and told him okay. I'll send him some very personal pictures to keep this quiet. He responded quickly with, I cannot wait, Sadie. Now, I knew who it was. My name is Mercedes. Everyone who doesn't call me by my first name calls me Mercy. Only my dad's best friend John calls me Sadie. He lives across the street from us. Both him and my stepdad served in the Marines and in Iraq just at different times. John always had creeped me out. No matter what, he always called me Sadie, even when I told him I hated it. When my parents weren't home, he would come pound on the door and ask to search the house to see if anyone was hiding. Before homecoming the year before, my boyfriend came to my door and John came running across the street in nothing but calf-high socks and his underwear, smoking and cradling a shotgun, harassing my boyfriend. He wasn't a large man at all, maybe five foot ten and pretty average build overall, but Something about him was intimidating. I didn't really want to involve my parents. I know my stepdad would believe John over me. I mean, they were near inseparable. Well, that night, my parents and a friend with her new boyfriend were going out on a double date. They had arranged for me to watch my little sister who was ten and my parents' friend's son from a previous relationship who was eight. This would be an easy job. Both kids were really well behaved. So after we said our goodbyes to our parents, I got the kids all settled playing a game while I watched TV. Several hours passed, it was around 9.30pm when I heard a knock at the door. Fearing it was John, I silently went to the door and looked out the peephole and saw it was my parents' friend's new boyfriend. I let him in and asked what was wrong. 
he said he thinks he forgot his cell phone in the kitchen counter. I said, oh, okay, well, you're welcome to go look, and I sat back down to watch my show. I heard him making some noise by the back sliding door, which was on the far side of the kitchen, and thought it was odd, but whatever. He then came out and said that he found his phone, and he was heading back out, and that he would see me soon. I don't know why, but the way he said that, while looking at me, just gave me the chills. About an episode later, I heard my back gate slam shut and click. Then someone began pounding on my front door. And I mean pounding hard. There was no stop to it, like someone was just beating on the door with both fists as hard as they possibly could. Getting really angry because the kids were sleeping in just the other room, I looked at the people and told them to knock it off. My breath left me and my heart stopped. It was someone in a ski mask. In a panic, I spun around to go grab my gun and call 911 when I saw just in the kitchen another man wearing a ski mask. I tried to run, but he caught me. I began screaming while he forced my arms behind my back and tied them together, then threw me onto the ground. He then walked over and opened the door, letting the other man in. I was screaming and trying to kick him as he came closer. He said, relax. I just want to have a little fun with you, Sadie. You owe me, girl. My friend and I'll be quick and no one has to get hurt. He then grabbed me by my hair to yank me off the ground. I don't know how, but I somehow managed to kick him in the shin. He screamed and called me terrible names. His friend rushed over with a kitchen knife in his hand. He handed it to the first man, who then in one long slow stroke slashed me from the middle of my chest to my belly button. It burned, it stung, and it hurt like nothing I've ever felt. I tried to scream but my voice caught in my throat. I wanted to puke and pass out. I was horrified. He dropped me back to the floor as he stomped around telling the other guy to tie up the kids. He replied with he can't find them, they must have ran out. There I saw my chance and rolled over onto my knees and jumped to run upstairs. I tripped and stumbled as they yelled and ran after me. I ran up the stairs and ran right into the first doorway which was my parents' room. I kicked the door shut and dove under my parents' bed crying and screaming. Just as I was about under, the door flung open and someone grabbed my ankles and yanked me out. He picked me up by my hair and threw me onto the bed. He began trying to claw what remained of my shirt off when there were more banging downstairs. He stopped and looked at the door, holding his hand over his mouth and nose. Bang, bang, bang. It sounded like someone was slamming their entire body into the door. Then finally a massive crash. Then the real fear began. Someone downstairs was smashing things, everything in their path. Then we heard the swinging. It was a deep, throaty, gritty voice with a slight Eastern European accent trying to sing slowly. I am death. I am here to eat you alive. I will tear a piece off of one at a time. I will bathe in your blood. Satan will love me and I will be him. It only sounded slightly song-like, but it sounded so demonic. It had such a booming echo. I began to scream and cry harder as I could hear it thumping up the stairs. Then all of a sudden the other guy shouted and there was a loud crack and smashing and some screaming before a loud smashing hollow squishy thump. Then the stomping continued with a slow laughter all the rest of the way to the door. As I saw the shadow enter the doorway the first man held the knife to my throat while I screamed and thrashed. I seriously wet myself crying while he yelled stop or I'll cut her. The shadow stopped and laughed again as he held up his arm over his head. The first man suddenly dashed the shadow. The shadow moved so quick I couldn't see when I heard a crack, then a gurgled sigh as the man slumped to the floor. The shadow came to me with outstretched arms and said calmly, It's okay, Sadie. You're safe. Close your eyes. I'll get you out of here. As he picked me up under my neck and knees, as we walked into the light, I saw that it was John. He took me to his house and I honestly blacked out. 
Next thing I knew, I was in an ambulance on my way to the hospital. Several days later, the police came and got my story and told me how lucky I was to have had someone like him near. When I was released, my parents told me what happened. The kids ran to John's house and told him some men broke in and he told them to call 911 as he ran to our house. He killed the first man by breaking his leg then stomping on his head. The second man was seriously injured with two stab wounds and a broken arm. He was also arrested. His name was Paul. He was the new boyfriend of my parents' friend. When they were out, he said he felt sick and was going to head home. The police ended up finding he was the one blackmailing me. I never would have thought John would be my savior. I hated him for so long. He was just a very cautious man who cared deeply for my stepfather and his family. He had no family of his own. I didn't feel safe for almost a year without John around. I pretty much lived in this house for that time. He taught me how to shoot, how to defend myself with anything I could find, including my hands and even a newspaper. Unfortunately, John was killed by a drunk driver six months ago. It wasn't until after he died I found out about his past. He had a troubled childhood and joined the Marines as soon as he turned 18. He went force recon, then four years after went to special forces. He retired after 12 years of service. I just graduated from college this past May. I enlisted in the Marines and leave for boot camp in July. I figured this is the least I could do to honor his memory. Please remember, John, he was truly an amazing man, and I wouldn't be here to share this story if it wasn't for him. Before I begin, I feel the need to explain some backstory. Throughout middle school and most of high school, I had depression from losing my father. I would self-harm and I had anorexia. I feel the need to share this to show that I wasn't in a place to be dating and that I was a very vulnerable young girl. It was my senior year of high school and I was pretty popular because I easily made people laugh. Admittedly, my school was very small. My class graduated with about 100 kids and had 100% graduation rate. Due to this, I knew everyone in my graduating class and could only point out a few that I didn't get along with. I think because I was so well known and not shy about my mental state, that's why my ex decided to pursue me. He was a new kid from another country, so of course this was the thing that he would use to reel me in. It wasn't long before he and a mutual friend of ours had convinced me to go on a date with him. The first date I remember he seemed so kind and caring. And looking back, I don't see any red flags other than him maybe being too nice. After that first date, I had already fallen and he knew this. He love-bombed me after that first date. Love-bombing, for those who don't know, is when an abuser will show you lots of love and affection very soon in the relationship to manipulate you into staying. Just two days after our first date, he was already texting me that he loved me. Quickly, we were official and he would let everyone around us know that. It was an intense relationship that lasted three months, but it felt like three years. During our time together, it didn't take him long to manipulate me into skipping classes with him. During one of those skippings, we got in his car and we were driving. I didn't know where we were going, but we soon stopped in a wooded area near our school. This was the very first time he assaulted me. He used my trust and my love against me. Basically, that first time, he'd made me do things to him, and he stranded me so that I had no choice. Afterwards, I didn't know what to do. I couldn't just leave. I loved him, but it felt wrong. I didn't leave because he would always tell me about his own issues, and I thought leaving him would be the wrong thing to do. On another occasion, we were kissing in his room when he grabbed my hand and took control. Another time, he held me down. Before New Year's, we had planned to have me spend the night at his place. He kept talking about going all the way and because I was scared I made up an excuse. I told him that my mother had grounded me and I couldn't go. I spent New Year's alone, frantically checking to make sure all the windows and doors were locked and in panic. 
Despite everything that happened with me, I have never been the jealous type. He would always mention this girl around me and tell me not to be jealous, and I would tell him I wasn't, but I guess I should have been because I found out that he was cheating on me with her. The day we actually broke up was triggered by him, but ultimately brought up by me. I think he could feel me pulling away, and so he tried to scare me by saying that if I didn't treat him better, he'd leave me. I snapped at him in that moment. I brought forth everything that he had done to me and then broke up with him. For about two weeks after, he begged me over the phone not to leave him. I stayed home from school those two weeks in fear, telling my mother that I wasn't feeling well. At the end of the two weeks, my mother told me I had to go to school. I knew she was right, but I wasn't ready. I broke out in tears and told her everything. Her response? You didn't even go all the way. All of this over some boy? You can stay home today, but you're going tomorrow. I felt so invalidated. That day I told my best friend that I was going to end my own life. But my wonderful friend went to the school counselors and the police came to my home. They had to stay with me most of the day until my mom got home from work. I decided to come out and tell my friends at school about what had been happening for the past three months. When he got wind, he turned it on me and convinced people that I was spiteful in doing this to harm him. Out of the about 40 kids I saw as close friends, I walked away from that experience with about five. After that, there were a bunch of kids who came to me telling me of their own experience with him. I have been with this bully and that's what he was. After this, he started following me around school. He would lurk outside my classes. He knew my schedule inside and out and would pop up in places he knew I'd be. My life had become a nightmare from that point and only got better when I described what happened to a teacher. They couldn't do anything due to lack of proof and it not happening on school grounds, but he believed me. I finally had an adult in my life who didn't invalidate me. Anytime he saw my ex lurking around, he would get him in trouble. Life is better now. Things do get better. He stopped following me around and I no longer live in fear. I still have trouble and I have flashbacks when I'm reminded of him, but I'm working on myself. This experience has given me the desire to get better and work on myself, which I didn't have before. So when this all started, I was in 6th grade and I was 12 years old. My mom and her fiancé of 6 years had just broken up and we couldn't afford the house we lived in with them, so we had to get an apartment for the two of us. At this time, when my mental health issues really started to show themselves, my mother had barely paid attention to me between her fiancé and my drug addict brother who lived with our dad in Ohio. Now, I had severe anxiety, depression, and borderline personality disorder since I was about four years of age after my dad left. However, due to her distractions, she never noticed any of the signs I was showing. Now, around this time is when she finally started to notice me and my struggles, but not until after a school counselor had called her after finding I had begun self-harming. So, I had been in a really fragile state and was young and naive and would listen to anyone who wanted to pay attention or acted like they cared. I had been a pretty serious dancer. I did all styles and was a soloist in competitions and have been invited to national competitions and to be part of the national team of dancers from around the country. So like I said, I was a pretty serious dancer. At some point, child me being, well, a child... I like to show off my tricks and I uploaded small little tips and tutorials on YouTube. One day, I got a message from a girl named Katie. Katie told me she was a gymnast and would like to talk to me about tips on stretching and such since the video she saw was one I had posted on stretches to be able to do the splits. She had asked me if I had Skype and due to the divorce between my parents and the birth of my nephew, I had already had Skype to be able to talk to my dad and try to see my nephew on Skype although that one never worked out. Anyways, we talked for a couple of days, and she told me she wanted to introduce me to her twin brother Patrick, or PJ, which one he'd prefer, but I was introduced to him as Patrick. 
Now, like I said, I was a young and I was naive, and my mom didn't really pay much attention to me. So I'd Skype Katie and Patrick, although they would never be on camera. They always had the excuse that it was broken. They supposedly attempted one day, but it was so blurry I could just see the outline of a person. Anyways, Katie came to me to have a competition of who could... Now, trying to think of a better way to say this, do more inappropriate things on camera. Which I'm pretty sure... What she said they were doing is not what was happening at all, but me being young, naive, and stupid and never warned by my mother about these kinds of things agreed. They wanted me in my skivvies to do splits and dance stretches or whatever, and she said that she'd basically, well, you get the picture. They wanted to watch. Looking back now, I'm completely confused by all of this, and this is nowhere near the end. After a little bit, I was really annoyed at the fact that they only communicated on Skype with me and that they never showed their faces or let me hear their voices. They finally gave me a phone number but said that they could only text because the phone didn't have minutes, which I'll get to that later. This helped and made me feel a little bit better, but on Skype, they only ever wanted me to strip and stretch. I'll try to tell them no, but Katie would threaten to hurt Patrick, who by this point had sweet-talked me enough into forming a long-distance relationship with him. However, I don't count it as a real one. Again, me being young and scared, thought I had to do it to protect him. My mother, who had been oblivious to all of this, had finally discovered things because of an image that was sent to my school email which my science teacher had full access to. My mom went through my phone and computer to discover what was going on. Of course, I was grounded from my laptop, but my mother still let me text Patrick because she felt that it was all Katie's influence. So I maintained contact. Also, at some point through this, I became friends with Patrick on Facebook. However, it's not important as much until later. And so time goes on, and we continue to text until I get my laptop back. Then Katie is back and influencing everything and of course my mother finds out. I get my phone taken away for good and laptop as well. Not kidding, I never got them back, ever. And the following summer I had gone to visit my dad's. At this point my mom, catfishing long distance boyfriend, had sent me an iPod Touch, which we found out later when I cracked the screen and took it to the Apple store was bought by a woman in Wisconsin. We didn't know, but this man was supposedly living in England for a business thing. But he doesn't have anything else to do with the story, so I won't get into that. So with my iPad touch, I had Patrick's number saved, and by this point, I had been done with the whole situation. But I realized I could call the number to see if he was lying because my dad lived in another state, and Patrick wouldn't know the number. I called, and an adult male voice answered. I said I was looking for Patrick and they immediately hung up and blocked my dad's number. So that basically confirmed it to me, and I removed him from Facebook and blocked him. I went on for months, never hearing from him, until I get a message from a friend of mine. She said he was messaging her looking for me, so I unblocked him to see what he wanted. We chatted for a couple of days until I decided I was done putting up with him. Now at this point I was on medication that did not disclose certain side effects that showed up in testing and I had them. However, no way to know that it was because of the meds, I became pretty promiscuous online and due to this I was grounded from all technology. Now the friend he had contacted was my Girl Scout troop so we saw each other frequently and he'd always message her to ask about me. Whenever I had technology at the time, I had some sort of messages from him, but I ignored it mostly. Now when I was 17, so this is 5 years after we met and about 3 to 4 after I stopped talking to him, I got a message from an old friend from 6th grade. Now, due to moving out of our house when I was in 6th grade, we moved out of the district but we decided to just have me finish the year where I was. So I hadn't seen or spoken to this friend since we were 12. She told me a boy named PJ was messaging her and asking about me and wanting to contact me. I was livid. I decided to unblock him and see what he wanted. I confronted him for messaging other people and trying to drag them into things. 
Suddenly he says he still has the old pictures and I asked him which ones. He presented to send me photos of myself at 12 years old. All disgusting. To which he got me very angry, telling him he had no right to have those and that I would report him to police and he complied with deleting them. At least, I hope, but probably not. That's the most severe it's gotten, but to this day, he still tries to contact me trying to act all sweet and charming. Now, I'm a nice person and I respect all people until you do something to me. Last I spoke to him, he had contacted me either shortly before or after my wedding, to which I decided to finally go ahead and block them. And I haven't heard another word since. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r let's read official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. If you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. All links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends, and remember, waka waka.